Thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, so we were asked over the next hour to address this question, have we progressed enough in BMT to prevent or treat acute GVHD effectively? Um, and I think um, we probably all know the answer to this, but hopefully we can discuss it uh, in depth. I have no uh, conflicts of interest with uh, what I'm about to speak about. Um, so for some background data, this is uh, data from the CIBMTR looking at the causes of death after unrelated donor transplants. And you can see that back in the 1980s to 2002, GVHD contributed to 14% um, of unrelated donor deaths. And with the most up-to-date uh, data, it's now 16%. So I think the answer to the question is no, we've not progressed enough. Um, before we kind of go into uh, the, the ways that we are trying to prevent and treat GVHD, it's always good to remind ourselves about the pathophysiology, which we know is a three-step process, uh, initially with uh, injury to the host environment, with the conditioning, a regimen that causes induction of inflammatory cytokines, then leading to T-cell activation, proliferation and differentiation, and eventually to cellular and inflammatory attack on the patient. And this is a cascade that if we don't stop, it only continues to progress and worsen over time. So how do we better prevent GVHD? Um, there's obviously been a number of strategies um, tested over the last several decades, and I just wanted to address a couple of the newer ones that have been developed, and firstly, looking at medications. Um, so this is a bone marrow transplant clinical trial network study. For those of you that are not aware of what the BMT-CTN is, it's a, um, a multi-center consortium of transplant centers funded by the NIH that um, is testing many different aspects of transplant and clinical trials in order to come up with answers faster than just single uh, single center trials. So in this trial known as B BMT CTN 1203, it was a multi-center phase two randomized trial to look at novel approaches of preventing GVHD compared to control uh, cohort generated from the CIBMTR that used GVHD prophylaxis of tacrolimus and methotrexate. Um, for this trial, subjects were 18 to 75 years of age, had a malignant diagnosis, and received a matched, either related or matched unrelated donor transplant, followed um, after having had reduced intensity of conditioning. And they were randomized to receive either TAC MMF and post transplant SI, or TAC methotrexate and maraviric, or TAC methotrexate and bortezomib. And the endpoint was a composite endpoint of GRIFs, which was you had uh, either grade 3 GVHD, grade 3 to 4 GVHD, or chronic GVHD requiring systemic immune suppression or you relapse from your disease or you died. And any of those events, you hit this endpoint. And there's been very good data to, to show that a composite endpoint such as this one really answers the question well, are we doing a good job of preventing GVHD? Because obviously we could prevent it but cause more relapse, or we could prevent it but cause death. And that's why when you think of when we're speaking to families or patients, they want to be alive and well a year or two years after transplant and not have any of these events occur. So this has become a more prevalent uh, composite endpoint to look at than just the, the incidence of GVHD. So in this trial, um, the results showed, as you can see here, the blue dotted line was TAC, MMF, and post-transplant SI. And it was superior in controlling GRIFs than either the TAC methotrexate maraviric arm or the bortezomib arm or the controls. Um, and from these data, um, was generated the new trial, CTN 1703, which is taking this post-transplant SI approach and comparing it in a randomized fashion to the TAC methotrexate, because in the other trial, that was only a historical control. So this is hopefully the definitive randomized phase three trial. It's ongoing now. 
um, and it's for those subjects who have uh, a malignancy receiving reduced intensity and again either a related or unrelated uh, peripheral blood stem cell transplant. Um, it's still accruing so we'll see what the answers show. But um, the data from this trial really showed that the post-transplant size we all know is um, very promising and, and showing um, a, a good reduction of uh, GVHD uh, without impacting survival or relapse. Um, another trial that's been developed by the CTN to try to prevent GVHD is looking at other methods of preventing GVHD without the, the use of calcineurin inhibitors. And so the two major ways of doing that is either to continue with post-transplant PSI but not use a calcineurin inhibitor or to do CD34 selection of the graft. Um, and obviously there's a lot of advantages of not having calcineurin inhibitors after transplant. And in this trial, it's a myeloablative platform um, and it's for patients with malignancy who are getting a matched donor, um, but it, um, and, and it could be un, any age under 65. And they'll either receive a bone marrow with um, post-transplant tacrolimus and methotrexate it is a conventional GVHD prophylaxis or marrow with post-transplant psi and no calcineurin inhibitor or the CD34 selective graft. Um, it's still accruing, so it'll be interesting to see how these patients do. But obviously there's other strategies besides just medications or T-cell depletion to try to prevent GVHD. And that's been a focus that we've had at the University of Minnesota. And one of the things we've looked at are T-regulatory cells. And um, this has really been driven by my colleague Bruce Blazer, who um, really pioneered um, the, understand, the, the studies in order to understand Tregs. Um, he showed in the mouse model that when, um, and that's on the first uh, lower uh, right-hand graph there, that um, mice that had um, adopted transfer of fresh Tregs um, survived longer, had less GVHD than those that didn't. But it was mostly remarkable if they, if they received expanded Tregs, so got a lot more Tregs than just the fresh ones. And that's really because in the mouse, Tregs only comprise about 5 to 10 percent of their CD4 cells. But if you can expand those cells before you give it to the mice, it really helps prevent GVHD well. And these master regulators of the immune system, these Tregs, are even less prevalent in our, in our, in human cells, only comprising one to two percent. And so, given this mouse data, um, we were challenged to try to bring this and translate it to the humans as a means of preventing GVHD. So we first did this in 2004, looking at peripheral blood, and um, there are a number of challenges in. Um, in isolating the cells and growing them. And so after just three patients on a trial that um, I was a PI of, we decided to change our strategy and to derive uh, Tregs from core blood. And this work was done by uh, my colleague Claudio Brunstein um, and, the, and many others at the University of Minnesota. Um, and you can see on the left-hand side here, what was done is a core blood unit um, was taken and um, CD34, sorry, CD25 uh, positive selection for those cells. Then the cells were um, induced and proliferated and grew, and that product was given to the patient at the same time they received a double cord blood transplant. Um, it, it was a, a dose escalation trial. Um, and you can see on the right-hand side there, when they compared those patients that received Tregs at the time of a double cord transplant to historical control that didn't and just had sirolimus and MMF as GVHD prophylaxis, those that received the Tregs had a lower incidence of grade 2 to 4 GVHD. Numbers were small, but it was encouraging. The challenge here, though, however, was it was hard to generate enough cells from one core blood unit. Um, it was expensive um, and ideally we wanted to be able to third bank these um, these Tregs, but even to generate enough for many patients, it was very challenging. So then we decided let's go back to peripheral blood as a source of Tregs, but we'll, we'll slightly change it. And this was based on data, again, Bruce Blazer's lab showed 
that um, you can induce naive T cells into the phenotype of T regs. And these inducible T regs are made by, at least um, in Bruce's hands, by inducing them with TGF beta, IL2, and sirolimus. Um, and the advantages of doing this is you can increase the number of cells that you're producing. Very easy to isolate these cells. Um, and you can use the same donor for the inducible Tregs as the stem cell graft. So you don't need to worry about allostimulation or rejection. So we brought this to the clinical uh, arena, um, and we did a dose escalation trial of these inducible Tregs um, in adults. Um, and saw that um, we were able to grow the cells well. They were given with, uh, with no DLTs. And there was, again, um, although it wasn't significant this time compared to historical controls, a hint that um, these cells indeed um, help to prevent GVHD better than the historical controls. The challenge was, was the cost. And so with the dose escalation, it ended up being $100,000 per product. So essentially $100,000 per patient on top of all the costs of um, the, the normal cost of a transplant. So that was quite prohibitive. Um, we're still working at trying to figure out how to use Tregs um, in a more cost efficient manner um, because obviously cellular products like this um, hold a lot of promise, um, but it, the, it's still a challenge to do this in a cost-effective manner. Um, so that's trying to prevent GVHD, and then obviously um, we haven't done it well enough that we still need to learn how to better treat GVHD. So for some historical control about how we've done in the past with treating GVHD, this is data from Dan Weisdorf from our center who um, looked at 197 patients who developed GVHD after a sibling donor transplant, um, transplanted back in 1979 to 1987. And these patients either received steroids or other immune suppression, but those that received steroids, 41% achieved, achieved a complete remission at day 28. Not surprisingly, those that didn't have a CR had poor survival, but for all patients, they didn't really have optimal survival, as you can see on the graft. We then um, did another analysis in a, a more recent cohort compared to that one in the 1990s, looking at 443 patients from our center that had GVHD. This time, instead of just siblings, we had a cohort with unrelated donor transplants, both marrow and peripheral, peripheral blood, as well as just a few cord. We were just starting to do cord blood transplant back then. All treated in a uniform fashion with steroids, and we saw that 35% achieved a CR. So no better than what Dan had presented um, in the uh, previously, and. Um, our overall survival was only 53%. So really hadn't really improved either on the response rate or on survival. And then for a more recent cohort, um, this was recently uh, published. This is CIBMTR data um, of 2,900 patients with uh, GVHD, all who, who had leukemia. Um, transplanted in 1999 to 2012, and they did note that severe GVHD did appear to be decreasing over time, um, but when they looked at survival, they really only saw those, those patients that had CSA-based therapy uh, or, or GVHD prophylaxis therapy, there's no improvement in survival, as you can see on the right-hand side. The left-hand one with the tacrolimus-based therapy, um, they are seeing some improvement in survival, but really it's only those that had grade 2 GVHD. So despite everything, um, really over the last 30 years, we haven't done a great job in treating GVHD. So how do we better identify our patients? I think part of the problem with these data sets is that we're putting all patients together. It's kind of archaic. It's like putting all leukemia patients together and saying, what's the survival? With GVHD, we've not done a great job of trying to figure out who are the bad players and who are the ones that are going to do well. Certainly, clinically, we know when we're at the bedside, you kind of get an idea of who's, 
or who's developing terrible GVHD, and who's got a case that's not so bad. But we have a, a t hard time measuring that in a very concrete way. And we thought that if we could better identify patients with high-risk GVHD, then we could give them better effective upfront therapy. And when you think about it historically, again, for high-risk patients, we often call those grade three to four by the Glucksburg GVHD grading system. And what people often um, forget is that this grading system was, based, was designed in 1974. Uh, from 43 adults who had myeloablative matched sibling donor transplants from 1969 to 1973. That's all the data. And yet we all talk about grade 3, 4 GVHD as, as you know, concrete data that it's bad GVHD. Similarly, the CIBMTR grading system was, um, albeit in a greater population of over 2,000 patients, was designed um, after examining patients who received a myeloablative match sibling donor bone marrow transplant from 1986 to 1992. And in that setting, we often think of severe GVHD as grade C or D. Um, and certainly people are developing biomarkers in order to, to determine who has high-risk GVHD. But we hypothesized that if we looked at the individual initial GVHD organ stage at onset, we'd better be able to identify the high-risk patients versus just looking at the stage. Sorry, versus looking at the grade, so looking at the stage. So to do this, what we did is we took multi-center data, University of Minnesota, Michigan, Paris, and then two CTN trials. And we had 1,723 patients that were transplanted from 1990 to 2007. We looked at their data and looked at the organ involvement of skin, liver, lower GI, or upper GI. And with all the combinations and permutations, you get 67 categories of the nature of the GVHD. We looked at the CRPR rate at day 28 for those 67 categories and ranked them from the best CR to the worst. And then the groups that had a similar response rate, we collapsed them and we ended up with 17 categories. And then we tested these 17 categories looking at response at day 28, TRM and survival at six months. And so when we did this, you can see the 17 categories here with those patients that had stage one to three skin as a reference group, looking at response rate for all the other groups, you can see the upper group with a p-value was no different in their response compared to skin only. And the lower groups had a significantly lower uh, odds ratio of achieving a response at day 28. In a similar fashion, in these groups, we looked at mortality at six months. Again, the upper groups were no different than skin only. The lower groups had a significantly higher risk of mortality. Similarly, when we looked at transplant-related mortality at six months, the upper groups were similar and the lower groups were similar but different from each other. And so from this, we decided we would call this upper group standard risk GVHD and this lower group high risk GVHD. And what we saw is that the standard risk patients had a probable, 69% uh, of them achieved a response at day 28 compared to the high risk groups that only 43% achieved a response. And what was more remarkable, if you look at the burgundy uh, colors here, that's CR. So you can see that the standard risk patients had 48% of them had a complete response at day 28 versus high risk at only 27%. We also saw that TRM at six months was twice as high in the high risk patients than in the standard risk patients. And we've called this the Minnesota grading system of high risk versus standard risk. We did it initially divide it into three, but it, they, it didn't divide well into three groups. Many people ask that question, so that's why we just have standard risk and high risk. And we just recently validated the scoring system in a new cohort of patients. And we also have a free website that you can just click on there and click on each organ, what the stages of each organ, and it will tell you whether it's a standard risk patient or a high risk patient. 
because these are the categories here and there's too hard to remember. The standard risk comprises about 84% of patients at onset of GVHD with the high risk being 16%. But again, we've shown that patients with high risk GVHD have three times less likely chance of responding to steroid therapy and a two, increase, two times increased risk of mortality in TRM than the standard risk patients. We also, and I don't have time to show you these data, but we've shown that this, more, this Minnesota GVHD risk score more accurately reclassifies patients as high risk or low risk than either the modified Glucksberg or the CIBMTR. So the positive predictive value and negative predictive value is better in the Minnesota grading system, and this has all been published. So what, we, what we're um, proposing with this grading system is that with those patients with high-risk GVHD, they are candidates for new th therapies because steroids are not working well enough. But likewise, those with standard-risk GVHD, maybe they don't need steroids or as high a dose as people are giving at onset. We should start treating patients differently. And obviously, too, it'd be good to combine this knowledge with biomarkers, because many people are looking at biomarkers. Is that going to demarcate risk at onset? And so that's what the CTN did with this trial. Um, this was a randomized phase two multicenter trial. And what it was asking the question, and based on preliminary data from Moffitt in Florida, that sirolimus is an alternate steroid-free treatment for patients who have standard risk GVHD. And so this um, study wanted to ask that in a prospective manner. Could we treat patients with standard risk GVHD with sirolimus only and not give them steroids, which obviously would have a lot of potential benefit without all the side effects of steroids. What we also asked in this study is, would biomarkers help us also determine risk in patients? And so we used the Ann Arbor bio biomarker system, where Ann Arbor 1 or 2 is standard risk and Ann Arbor 3 is high risk. So how this worked was, um, and this is just background data on Ann Arbor biomarkers, ST2 and Reg3 Alpha were used. And um, this is Jamie Ferrara and John uh, Levine's work. They've shown that um, they, can they, they can separate out the risk of patients based on whether they're Ann Arbor 1 or 2, which is standard risk with non-relapse mortality less than 40%, and Ann Arbor 3 high risk with non-relapse mortality being greater than 40%. And they plug in this complicated um, uh, mathematical model the levels of ST2 and Reg3 and come out with whether they're Ann Arbor 1, 2, or 3. So it's not just a level of those biomarkers. So in the CTN trial, patients that were newly diagnosed with standard risk GVHD as defined by the Minnesota grading system were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either sirolimus or steroids. And at the same time, they started therapy, but they, their biomarker blood was taken. It took a couple of days to get that biomarker assessment back. And if they remained Ann Arbor 1 or 2, they stayed on the trial. Whereas if they were Ann Arbor 3, it was up to the treating physician what to do. So what was interesting with this trial is that we had 122 um, patients that on the Minnesota GVHD risk score were considered standard risk and were also considered standard risk on biomarkers. And only three, sorry, only four patients were taken out of the Minnesota standard risk group because they were found to be Ann Arbor 3. So in this setting at least, the, the biomarkers didn't really further define risk significantly beyond the clinical assessment. We also saw that sirolimus did a good job. If you look at just at the left-hand columns here, it's looking at day 28 response, whether patients receive prednisone or sirolimus for upfront therapy, and the response was the same. Um, and so basically this study showed that sirolimus is effective without steroids for standard risk GVHD. That's the first time anybody has shown effective therapy without steroids for upfront 
um, GVHD. Again, really showing that trying to understand the bad players up front can help us ta tailor the therapy better. And just in the last couple of minutes, I just want to talk about those patients that don't do well with upfront therapy. So how do we treat those? And basically, if you're not um, responding within a week or you progress within four days with GVHD, you need to do something. Certainly, there's a whole list of medications that have been tried, um, and none of them really have been proven to be um, the best player until recently. Um, oh, sorry. I was just going to say, in this slide here, Paul Martin did a, a whole analysis. This paper is really worthwhile reading because he has shown that it really depends on the size of the trial, whether it's prospective or retrospective. But at the end of the day, overall response is roughly about 58 at, at best. But the smaller, better controlled trials, response rates are lower. And it was it's really only uh, since ruxolitinib um, in the REACH trial a couple years or a year and a half ago now showed response rates of JAK1-2 inhibitor, uh, response rate of 55% for steroid refractory GVHD, um, that there's been really one, you know, it's kind of a game changer. It's now what every other trial has to compare itself to. Um, although it was very small numbers, the FDA approved it um, for steroid refractory GVHD. So hopefully I've shown that despite efforts to prevent and treat GVHD, it still is a major cause of non-relapse mortality in our patients. And tailoring strategies based upon individual patients may provide more effective therapy, um, especially for those with high-risk GVHD and reduce unnecessary toxicity, especially those with standard-risk GVHD. Um, but we're now going to hear some exciting new uh, ways of, of thinking about GVHD and treating GVHD. Thank you very much. <laughs> Professor McMillan, you can come here and have a seat.